please stand by. We're about to begin. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Slurry Micro Mix Design and Material Testing Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. Instructions will be given at that time. If you should require assistance during this call, please press star, then zero. I would now like to turn the conference over to your host, Jason Biddy. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Salas. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Jason Beats, and I'm at the Federal Highway Resource Center, and we're partnering with the Haven Preservation and Recycling Alliance, also referred to as PPRA, on a series of these pavement preservation webinars on, on pavement preservation by selecting preventative maintenance strategies so we can extend the life and reduce the long-term cost of pavement surfaces. Through the use of AEMA, AMA, ERA, and ISA products and treatments, as well as federal highway uh, tool guides and efforts that can be used for agencies. Today's webinar will focus on slurry and micro mix designs and material testing. You will see a number of polls up to your screen. We ask you to take a moment to answer those, and we'll close them in just a minute as the presentation begins. We also encourage questions during the webinar. All attendants are on mute, but can submit any questions to the chat function on the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, and we will answer those as time permits. We'll, we will be offering PDHs for today's webinar upon request, so please let us know after the webinar if you would like to receive a copy. I'd now like to introduce the speaker for today, Sally Houston. Sally has been a technical manager for Valley Surrey Sales since 2007. She manages an ASHTO accredited laboratory that includes product development, mix design, asphalt performance grade testing, and quality assurance for all aspects of the pavement preservation for the industry. Sally has been involved with the industry for 27 years and has worked across the continent. She, she was recently named as one of the 20 to, to watch in the 2020 by Women of Asphalt. She contributes to the technical advancements and the promotion of the industry through active involvement for the research and development, committee work, and industry association. She lives in Davis, California with her husband, Gary, and her two children. Sally, PPRA and I would like to say thank you for your time today, and, we'll go ahead and, and I will go ahead and pass it over to you uh, to start a presentation for today. All right, thank you, Jason. Um, thanks to FHWA and PPRA for allowing me to come and present on micro and slurry mix designs. As you may have heard, I have a lot of experience uh, in this area. I've been doing mix designs for decades now. <laughs> so, and in this laboratory we produce, we issue maybe 100 mix designs a season. Um, so a good bit of famili familiarity there. Um, I see there's some poll questions out, and looks like we have a lot of uh, beginner not really familiar with micro and slurry. Um, so I would encourage you if there's something um, that's not making sense to you or if you want to answer, ask a question in the middle of the presentation, that would be just fine, and I'll do my best to, um, to keep up with them. If I miss you, we'll also have questions at the end of the presentation as well. Um, let's see here. Hey, Sally, before we get started, we have a poll question regarding uh, the United States, which is one of the largest producers of emulsion asphalt, annually produces, and the answer is, 3 million tons of the emulsion. So it looks like people actually uh, must have uh, got this answer prior or whatever, but it seems like everybody got that answer right. So how about that? That's great. That's a lot of emulsion. So uh, here we go. Closing out the poll questions, and we'll get to the presentation. All right, are we ready to go, Jason? We're ready. Okay. All right, so we're going to walk through um, micro and slurry mix designs, kind of what we consider when we're doing this. We're going to talk about the different materials that go into these designs, and we'll talk about um, 
specifications of those individual materials and the specifications on the mix itself, the slurry or the micro. And we'll, t we'll talk a bit about the mix design, uh, what we do in the mix design, and why those tests, um, performance tests, matter. Uh, so we'll, we'll try and touch on all of that as we go through the presentation. Hopefully, uh, most of you are familiar uh, what, with Floria Micro basically as a pavement preservation technique. It's kind of like painting your house. Um, if you have a wood house, you're going to apply uh, some paint to it every, I don't know, 15, 20 years to make sure that that house, um, the wood doesn't start to deteriorate underneath. The idea of the Soria Micro is you're going to do the same thing, but you're going to do it to your, your roads, and hopefully you're going to do it in a timely manner so that you're preserving that road um, from elements like rain, sun, et cetera, and uh, you're going to extend the life of that pavement um, for years and years if you apply it at the right time. So these systems, Soria Micro, can be applied at ambient temperatures. Uh, you don't need to compact, although that can be a part of the process as well. You can use advanced materials for microsurfacing. You can add some things in that are going to give you uh, uh, better properties. You're not going to fix a lot of structural problems with a micro or slurry. It is a thin lift um, system. And uh, you're not going to be able to use this in cold temperatures or when it's raining, uh, typical for any type of paving activity. And uh, again, not for extremely deteriorated pavements. But there's always the opportunity uh, to uh, do multi-layer systems, which we're not really going to talk about here, but you can address um, more deteriorated uh, or, or structural problems if you start adding layers, such as a cape seal or three-layer system. There's lots of places to go to get information on micro and slurry. Uh, start with ISSA at slurry.org. Um, this is where all those who are involved in slurry congregate. There's over 60 contract or members, and there's over 150 members uh, worldwide. They have guidelines for both slurry seal and microsurfacing, which um, is really what you need to get started. It'll give you the basics of um, the materials specs and uh, the performance specs on the mix designs and what it is you need to have a good micro or slurry system. Uh, there's also available, there's an inspector's manual from ISSA, which is great for those of you in the field. It'll cover things such as the calibration of the slurry and micro equipment and what to look for when the contractor's out there doing the job. You can also look for, uh, these, these are the designations from the different groups. You have AASHTO, ASTM, and ISSA. Um, for, these are the specifications and uh, guidelines to give you the numeric there. You're going to get this presentation at the end um, here, so uh, th that'll be avail available afterwards. Here's just uh, here's your guidelines uh, for micro and slurry, your A105 and 143 from ISSA. And there's also a new guideline for polymer modified emulsified uh, asphalt slurry seal. A lot of uh, the slurry seal that's done these days does have polymer in the emulsion, and I'll mention that later on. There's a picture of the inspector's manual that you can get and uh, use out in the field. So when we're talking about slurry and, and micro, uh, there's five main components that go into the mix. You have your aggregate. Your emulsified asphalt, water is a big uh, portion of that mix. Uh, cement or other mineral fillers, uh, which can be optional in a slurry. You usually want to cement uh, in, a, in a microsurfacing. And then chemical additives can be used uh, as required to help retard or, or maybe even speed up the system. And we'll talk in more detail as we go. So um, here, let's put up a poll question. What group best describes you? Are you a, a, with an agency? Are you industry? Are you a supplier? Do you come from a laboratory? It's looking like there's a lot of agency folks on the call today. 
This is great. Hopefully this will be, um, if you're new to it, you'll consider putting this in your toolbox and to help with your roads. It's a cost-effective way to maintain the roads that you have in your cities and towns. Okay, did you show the results there, Jason? Yeah, I sure did, Sally. All right, thank uh, you. I automatically closed it up already, but sorry okay. about that. Oh, that's fine. The majority of you are with an agency is what, what I'm seeing. So let's talk about the different materials that go into to micro and slurry, and we'll talk, we'll talk about um, the specifications as well. For, the, for these different materials that go into the system. So with aggregate, uh, your aggregate is there. There's three types of gradations. One thing um, that's in common with all of them is that it's a very fine aggregate, uh, not, not large stone. I mean, the largest is going to be 3 eighths of an inch, um, and it goes down from there in size. So your type, you have a type one, two, and three. One being the finest, which is about an eighth of an inch passing, and on up to uh, three eighths of an inch for a type three. So you have type one, two, and three. Uh, you're going to use only a type two and three for a micro. We'll talk a little bit more as we go forward in the presentation. But the purpose of the aggregate is there to give structure and a wearing surface uh, to to the system. Then you have your asphalt emulsion, uh, the oil, as some, some refer to it. Uh, but this is uh, asphalt, which has been, this is a whole other presentation for another time, but as, asphalt emulsion is asphalt distributed in a water phase or emulsified in a water phase. So it's a, it's a great way to move asphalt around um, at more ambient temperatures. So your asphalt emulsion for these systems is either going to be what we refer to as neat, meaning no polymer in there, or you can add some polymer modification, which is a requirement of a micro system. And as I mentioned earlier, the majority, I would say, of slurry seals done these days have some uh, polymer modified emulsions in it as well. Uh, the purpose of the emulsion is to add the binder to your aggregate phase. It's going to give some waterproofing, and it's going to give your road that nice black color that we that we like when we're driving on roads. There's a lot of water in micro and slurry uh, mixes. It's there for mixing purposes, uh, lubrication, and handling of the material in the in the paver. Um, there is actually, to me, an astounding amount of liquid in these systems that disappears and or pushes out in a very quick amount of time. So when we're talking about slurry or micro, you may have anywhere from 5 6% additional water uh, into what, uh, in addition to what's already in the um, asphalt emulsion, up to anywhere, you know, 10 12% water uh, added in. And then if you add the water that's in the emulsion phase, all that water has to come out of that system be before uh, it's cured. But the water is there as uh, to help move this material. We can add some mineral fillers, and this is typically a cement or a limestone type or a lime, limestone dust or lime, a hydrated lime. Um, it's there. It can add, uh, give a, a nice consistency to the mix, and it gives strength and durability to the mat. And it helps in the curing process as well. And I'll get into a little more detail on that. Chemical additives is the, the last component. Um, so that is there to help control how the system sets up or uh, terms we use or break. Um, so this will help, uh, help say, for instance, you're working uh, like here in California, the morning it may start off in the 50s or 60s, and then by uh, the end of the day it could be approaching 90, 100 degrees. So your system's going to act, the mix is going to act a lot different in the afternoon than it is in the morning. So we might want a chemical additive on board the paver uh, to um, 
help slow it down, say, for instance, later in the afternoon. In a lot of uh, instances, the um, additive is the emulsifier that is in the asphalt emulsion, or it may be something like aluminum sulfate, which is popular out west. And um, it can also act as a, an adhesion promoter, which a lot of the emulsifiers do. So here's another question for you. Um, do you currently use Fleury or Micro in your area? Uh, yes or no? Uh, yes, we currently use it. No, we currently do not use, or we do not use, but intend to use in the future. We got a lot of users out there. I would say if you're not using it, then it's something that should definitely be considered. Uh, it's it's a great system, and it can really help uh, preserve preserve your investment um, in the pavement that you have already. Okay, so we look like 81 percent are currently using so. It's good to see. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the difference between slurry and microsurfacing. When and, and uh, when we talk about the asphalt emulsion, the polymer for slurry seal, the polymer is optional. Uh, in in the beginning of the slurry seal, um, when slurry first came out, it was typically an anionic emulsion. Um, and now it tends to be more on the cationic side, which is a, that's just the chemistry of the asphaltic emulsion, whether it has a negative or, or a positive charge. The cationic emulsifiers are a little more sophisticated, and we can control how the emulsion behaves in the system um, a little better when we're using cationic uh, emulsions. So uh, either, but with the slurry, you can use either or and the polymer is optional. When you're doing microsurfacing, it's always going to be a polymer modified asphalt emulsion and it's always going to be a cationic quick set, set type emulsion. Um, with slurry seal, you're going to have typically a little bit more water in the system, um, a little bit different chemistry, so the, the whole system is going to be more dependent on the weather and the physical um, uh, properties outside, whether the sun is shining, whether the wind is blowing, those type of things. But when we get into the microsurfacing, we're using more sophisticated uh, emulsifiers in the asphalt emulsion and a little higher quality um, other uh, components. And we're going to have more of a uh, chemical, we're going to be dependent on the chemical break. That's why a micro can be used um, at nighttime, because we don't need the sun to get that system to uh, to set up, we can depend on the chemistry to, to help that process along. So with the slurry, uh, again, I was saying there's a little bit more liquid in there in the box at the, at the back of the paver where the slurry, um, once it's mixed through the pug mill, is dropped into a box at the back of the paver and dragged along the road um, to the proper depth. And it's going to be... Um, uh, it's going to need more workability, so the, the fluids, and it's going to fill that box basically by gravity itself. When you're dealing with microsurfacing, you're going to have a stiffer mix, and you're typically going to have augers in the box that are going to push that mix to the edges of the um, paving box at the back um, to, get, to get that material onto the ground. And then with the aggregates, I think I mentioned we could use type 1, 2, or 3 for slurry seals, but you're only going to use a type 2 or 3 and micro, and it's going to be a, what we would call a cleaner and more durable aggregate. Uh, we'll get into those specifications. But the reason we don't use a type 1 for microsurfacing is the type 1 is so high and fine that uh, the chemistry we use in the micro really can't overcome all those fines and it's just going to break uh, uh, too quickly um, with those the high fines in the type 1. So you're, you're going to work more with the type 2 or type 3 aggregate if you're doing a true microsurfacing. For application purposes, the uh, slurry, again, is good for um, filling voids. It's great for covering aging parking lots. 
uh, it will give you a bit of a wearing course and prolong the, the life of the road. Um, you can get anywhere from 5 to 15 years um, out of a slurry or micro, depending on how well it's constructed and laid, and laid down, and also kind of where you are in your traffic and your weather. With the micro surfacing, you're going to be able to put a micro down in a higher traffic type road. Uh, you can rut fill with it because you, of the types of materials you're using. You can what we call stack the, um, the micro, so you can put multi layers down. Um, you can work at night with micro, like I was mentioning, because of the chemistry. And uh, with the micro, you're going to be able to correct uh, minor profile irregularities. Uh, you may have heard terms like a scratch course, where you put um, some micro down that will fill in those irregularities, and then you can put another layer on top of that to get a nice, smooth road. So there's a question here about, are both slurry and micro equal in high skid resistance, or do they differ? Uh, you're going to get your skid resistance typically from the type of aggregate you're using. So if you are requiring higher skid resistance, I, I would recommend using a type 3 aggregate, and also um, that you not roll uh, the mat once it's been put down so that you have those rocks um, giving you that bit of skid resistance. And also I think that maybe the po higher polymer content in a microsystem might uh, help with that as well. Oh, hang on, sorry, I'm looking at the questions here. And then there's a question about uh, fiber and micro. Uh, we might can talk about that a little bit later, but yes, fi fiber micro is um, uh, becoming really big. We do a lot of that out west, and it's um, you have special uh, feeders on the back of the paver that chop the fiber into, say, around a quarter inch size and feed it into the mix um, as it's being laid down, and you can get some added benefit from that fiber, such as uh, durability of the mat and flexibility as well. And the fiber is uh, great in uh, multi-layer systems. So here's uh, just a picture of the two boxes I mentioned. The slurry seal has no augers in it. Uh, as you can see, where's my arrow? Um, Sorry, I thought I had a pointer, but I can't find it. It's moved. Oh, here it is. So here's your slurry box. There's no augers in here, and it's requiring the, the mix to move out to the edges. Um, so it needs to be more fluid than, say, a micro. So here you can see the auger system working in a micro box that's forcing that material out towards the edges. And the micro system typically uh, it sets up quicker than the slurry as well, so you need all that to happen a, a little a little faster. Here's some examples of some roads where you can apply slurry and micro. Just your um, your neighborhood here. There's a slurry seal going down. Some secondary highways, uh, putting some micro down. This is, I believe, this is I-85 through Atlanta, so you know there's lots of traffic on that road. So again, type 3 microsurfacing, giving great skid resistance, nice black road um, for, so that they can clearly see your lines, um, your striping at night. This bottom right corner here, this is um, Saskatchewan, uh, the Saskatchewan highways. Every, every, uh, they have very short paving season, but they would go out and just rut fill their highways every summer, and that's all they would do. They wouldn't put, typically put uh, another course on top of this, although that is definitely an option after you rut fill. Um, they didn't seem to mind how it looked, uh, so they would just go through and rut fill every season in a lot of places. So when we start talking about the materials and how we test them, you know, what do these tests mean? Who should be doing the testing? Um, let's talk a little bit maybe about which tests actually matter 
and also very importantly, how do we sample materials in the field when we're doing these projects? With the asphalt emulsion, you're going to see terms uh, such as PMCQS, which is your polymer modified cationic quick set emulsion, or uh, MSE stands for microsurfacing emulsion, which is a PMCQS with maybe a little more sophisticated chem chemistry in it and probably a higher polymer loading um, than a PMCQS. Uh, but just that's just industry language, the MSE. You're going to test the emulsion for such things as viscosity, uh, which is going to tell you how it handles and flows. You're going to look at uh, the sieve test, which is going to tell you, is your uh, emulsion nice and smooth? Is, if, if you have any um, uh, particle, large particles in it, it's going to show up in the sieve test, and that might give you an indication that you have a stability problem. Uh, there is a stability test, which let, uh, will show whether the emulsion is holding up um, over a day. The storage stability test probably isn't of interest to anyone unless you're an emulsion supplier, and then you just want to know is that material going to um, stay in the tanks uh, without settling out over time. And uh, it's, I think most emulsion suppliers are like uh, us, that this material goes out the door so fast there's actually no point in running the five-day test. Then we take the emulsion and we uh, cook off the, the water phase, and you're left with what we refer to as the residue. And the residue is going to contain the asphalt that you used and any other um, solid components, such as your polymer um, that you use to manufacture with. And then you're going to test that residue for particular properties. One, you want to make sure you have enough of the asphalt binder in there, so you get it like a 62 typically. Minim, 60 to 62 percent minimum on your residue, depending on if it's slurry or micro. Uh, your penetration is the hardness of the binder that, or asphalt that you use, or the binder that's left behind. So you want to make sure that it's either hard or if you're in a colder climate, that uh, number is going to be higher because it's going to uh, the test. I'll show you the test in a moment, but um, it's going to the higher the number, the softer the binder. And then softening point, there's other tests you can run to give you an indication whether there's actually polymer in the system. Um, you may have heard of terms such as softening point, uh, elastic recovery, uh, torsional recovery, those type of tests. In the field, uh, when you're um, running the project, it's, I recommend that all agencies take samples. Uh, whether you get around to testing them or not, um, your contractor should see that you care enough to pull samples. And if there is an issue, you can have the material tested as long as you do it in a timely, a timely fashion, or at least maybe test one, once through the course of the project, depending on how big it is. But the important thing with the sampling emulsion is uh, make sure there's a sample cock on the truck or um, when you're offloading. and uh, run material out before taking the actual sample because whatever's in that line or in that sample cock is going to give you false uh, failing test results because it's probably dried out. You're going to have chunks, that sort of thing. So you want to make sure you get a real representative sample. Um, so run out, I recommend at least three gallons of material before you pull the actual sample. Store your sample in a nice, cool place. Um, and you can find guidelines for sampling at ASHTO T40 and ASCM D140. Hang on, I'm looking at questions here. So they're asking what, what else is used uh, for, this doesn't really jump in in this part of the presentation, but what other chemicals are used besides the emulsifier and aluminum sulfate to control the mix? Uh, those are the two main ones. The other thing that you can use to control the mix is the actual um, mineral filler. So your cement or your lime can also act um, as a control agent. Um, you can increase a little bit your amount of cement or decrease it. Uh, each, each aggregate behaves differently, um, so that's kind of something that has to be determined in the laboratory. 
but once you know how it works, you can use that to your advantage in the field. So asphalt emulsion sampling, again, um, making sure you run plenty through the line before you take your sample. Please use wide mouth jars um, so that the testers can access the materials. Don't send your samples in a Coke bottle or a Gatorade bottle. Please, you know, these are available all over uh, Uline or wherever you order your materials. Don't use metal. Um, emulsions can corrode. And uh, make sure you pull duplicate samples. I typically tell the contractor if you see the agency pulling a sample, pull one for yourself as well. There's things you can do in the field to um, uh, make sure the emulsion is looking good. Uh, it's not, it's just kind of a comfort level. You can run, you can buy window screen at the Home Depot and you can run the emulsion yourself uh, through the screen just to see if you're getting any um, particles. You'll see little things, a uh, sign of instability might be what we call BBs or gummy bears or whatever you want to call it. Um, might be an indication that you need to pull a representative sample and have it tested. And uh, so you can keep some window screen with you. This is a viscometer cup. You can test the viscosity out in the field if you want to. Um, there is a test method for that. So again, make sure you sample in a timely manner. Don't put those samples in the back of a pickup truck and let them jostle around and sit bake in the sun for three weeks before you get them to the lab. Uh, keep them in a nice, cool place. Please label properly. Uh, don't write on the lid, because if I have four samples and I take the lids off of two of them and I get them mixed up, then uh, I don't know what's what. So label properly. Put it on the actual container itself, date, sample location, the name of the product, your job, the name of the job, so it's for ease of tracking. Uh, and then use a qualified tester to test your, uh, your material. I recommend that you use someone who's AASHTO accredited. A lot of, I would say that most all uh, independent labs are AASHTO accredited, and these days I think any other laboratory um, doing these types of tests are uh, accredited as well. So just a quick question, do you sample and test uh, during your projects? Yes, you sample and test. Yes, you sample, but you only test if there's a problem. Or no, you don't. I recommend you, you test at least once during the course, but you definitely pull retained um, and hold on to them. Not testing is probably not the smartest route to go. If you need help finding a testing lab, I know that EMA or I or ISSA, any of us can help you find someone that can do that for you in your area. All right, so it looks like 75% are testing and sampling and testing, eight, about 18% only test if there's an issue. And there's a little less than 10% of you who aren't testing. All right. So here are just some images of emulsion testing. On the top left, you can see the, um, this is what emulsion is a nice brown liquid. Uh, when we run the viscosity, what we call the Sabalt viscosity, we're just filling uh, a known amount and then we're letting it drip down and fill um, a flask to a certain volume and we time it. So that's all, that's all that number is. If you see 20 to 100 viscosity, it's either take, it's going to take somewhere between 20 and 100 seconds to fill that flask. Here's your screen for the sieve. This is a, your $150, $200 screen that we use in the laboratory. Or you can uh, just get some window screen, which is about the same size as the screen in this, in this um, sieve cup. Um, and look at it in the field. This test right here is uh, for settlement and storage stability. So you just fill it with emulsion and you let it sit for a day or five days 
and you see if it's settled, you're going to take a residue of the bottom of the flask and a residue at the top. And if there's a big difference, you know you're getting lots of settlement. This is a distillation unit, so we're putting the emulsion in this um, distillation flask, and then we're um, sealing it up, heating it, and then uh, this is a condenser. The water phase comes off. You cool it off, and you collect it on the other side. And then we're left with the residue, and we're going to look at the residue and see what properties it has. These little cans, or we call them penetration cans, these are full of residue, and they're soaking in a temperature bath right here. This is an old-fashioned penetrometer. Um, this, there's a needle right here that uh, started ages ago. It's a number two sewing needle. Um, and it's still the same dimensions in use today. And what happens is you place this needle on the surface of the sample, and then you let it drop with a certain weight on it and for five seconds, and then you measure how deep it penetrates. And the further it goes in, the softer the material is. This is an example of softening point. So you have two small uh, round disks of uh, residue up here and you're slowly heating it up in a cold water bath up to whatever the softening point is when it hits the bottom here. So these two will hit the bottom, hopefully close together, and you'll get your softening point maybe around 136 Fahrenheit, somewhere around there. And that'll give you an indication of your polymer content. So let's talk a little bit about the aggregate and the differences between slurry and micro and those specifications and what they mean. Um, one of the most important tests, I believe, is the sand equivalence or the sand equivalency. Um, and that's going to give you an indication of how, how much of that do your fines in your aggregate are clay or clay-like material. Um, the clay content can be detrimental to your system. Clay has an extremely high surface area, and um, it can wreak havoc um, if there's too much of that present. So the lower the sand equivalence number, the more um, of that clay-like component you have relative to the sandier content. So a cleaner aggregate is going to have a higher sand equivalence which is required, as you can see, with the 65 minimum for microsurfacing. Durability is also going to give an indication similar to sand equivalence, but whether that aggregate is breaking down um, and abrading under shaking. Your LA Rattler or the abrasion test is you're tumbling larger components of the stone um, and seeing how much it hold, holds together. You can. Um, there's a maximum on how much loss or abrasion loss you can have. Your crushed particles, your, the angularity of the aggregate is important to these systems so that you get good interlocking, good, um, uh, you create a nice good mat, you get um, that skid resistance you want, et cetera. Round rocks, um, round rocks uh, tend to move a lot more than angular particles. So some, some specs will say 90% crushed, 100% is typically what, what you see. Uh, and then we have the gradations, which again, type 1 being your finer aggregate on up to type 3. Uh, the type 1 you're going to use to fill minor voids, great for parking lots, um, and areas that don't get a whole lot of traffic and where you want really smooth surfaces. Uh, like if little Johnny is going to be skateboarding on your roads, you might want a finer type 2 or type 3. Type 2 you can use to fill voids, and um, it'll fill moderate distresses. It'll give you a little more durability, definitely, than a type 1. And your type 3 is there for, again, uh, it gives you an improved wearing course. You can put higher traffic on it, and again, you can uh, rut fill. Someone is asking about um, crushed aggregate. What test? I don't know off the top of my head. I'll have to look up what the ASTM test for um, crushed aggregate. But there is one there, uh, and it's mostly it's a visual 
um, test on whether you have three crushed surfaces on, on your rock. Um, yeah, so I, I can get that ASTM number to you later. All right, let's see here. So when you're sampling aggregate in the field, again, sampling, proper sampling is extremely important for getting representative material. Um, it's important from the sampling perspective of sending material into the lab for the mix design, because the whole project is going to be based on that, to also testing um, in the field. So these materials being very fine, they will segregate in the pile. You'll see that the larger stones tend to go to the surface, and sometimes your finds may wash out if it's raining. But you got to get a front-end loader on that pile and mix it up really good. You're going to sample and then pull, uh, use a shovel, dig into the pile, and um, pull aggregate out in three different spots to get your sample. And typically, you're going to want um, you know, 50 pounds or more if you're going to be testing. So fill up a five-gallon bucket two-thirds of the way, and you've got a good sample. Um, I recommend that you sample anytime new aggregate deliveries are brought to the job site. Uh, we have seen times where what's brought uh, in the middle of a project doesn't match what was at the beginning of the project and wasn't what was used for the mix design. Um, I've seen issues where the sand equivalence of the material at the start of the project had a, was around 7580, and they went to a different portion of the quarry, or they um, brought a different quality of aggregate from uh, the aggregate pit, and the sand equivalence drops down in the 40s. And that's going to make a huge difference in the way your mix behaves. So you want to sample your aggregate. I would say at least sample your sand equivalence, your gradation, and uh, maybe the moisture content to make sure it's not overly wet and not fluctuating very much. Here's a picture of the sand equivalence test itself. You can see the sandy proportion at the bottom here, and this is your clay-like component above. And it's, again, it's a, it's a ratio of the two. So the more clay-like um, proportion that you have, the lower your sand equivalence is going to be. Here's a, just a, a diagram or a picture showing you how fine these aggregates really are. Um, and here is stepwise showing you the type 1, 2, and 3, uh, ranging from an eighth of an inch to 3 eighths of an inch, um, or three, uh, from 3 to 9 and a half millimeter. So we know we talked about the specification and what's required of the component going in, um, the main components, the aggregate and the emulsion specifically. And then we're going to get those materials into a laboratory and we're going to start testing the mix to make sure that they're compatible um, and that you can get some long-term performance uh, out of it. And we do all that through the different types of tests we do uh, in the mix design. So one of the first things we'll do in the laboratory is uh, we'll start mixing the components together. We'll take the aggregate, um, the water, you know, water, cement, emulsion, start mixing it together and making sure we can get what we call a hand mix or a mix time out of it. And we want at least 180 seconds usually. 120 is pretty fast for a micro, um, but it's going to it's going to be a, it is definitely going to be faster quicker system the micro is designed for that but you want the hand mix time to it's going to tell us is that mix going to stay um, fluid and are we going to be able to get it out of the pug mill and into the box the back of the paver and onto the ground um, before it starts to um, set up um, you don't want that to happen in the paver because that just creates a mess for the contractor, and they have to dig it all out, and then they have to start from zero again um, for portioning. So we try to figure out all that out in the mix design process, and we give them the ranges of the emulsion, water, uh, mineral filler, et cetera, that they can um, work in and get a good mix. 
So we run uh, what we call a cohesion test after that. So we make small samples and we put uh, uh, pressure and a torque on these little samples to see if the mat or the mix holds up. And that's going to give us an indication of traffic time, like how soon can we put traffic on this material. So if you're doing slurry or micros, your spec might say for slurry that you need to have traffic on it in one to four hours. On the microservicing, it may say an hour. Um, I've seen traffic on micro in less than 15 minutes, which is an amazing feat, I think, because if you consider the, the amount of emulsion and uh, water that are put into these systems, that the chemistry can actually make this mat cure out uh, and put uh, slow rolling traffic on it within 20 to 30 minutes is rather amazing. I'm still um, it still amazes me to this day as long as I've been doing this. So we can look at consistency of the mix. We want to make sure it's not too runny. Uh, we want it to have that right consistency so that it looks good when it goes down on the road and it's not running out into the gutters. And uh, the wet stripping test is there. Is the asphalt going to actually adhere to the aggregate and or is it going to strip off? So these are some tests that we run in the lab for compatibility. Uh, here. Hopefully you can see this. Um, this is a diagram of the paver itself. You can see the aggregate here. You've got a tank of emulsion and a tank of water and a smaller tank of your additive. It all goes on to this pug mill um, where it's mixed and then it comes out the back here and into the slurry box and then onto the, the road. And if you don't get the right mix time, it's going to chunk up and break, and this is what it's going to look like in your paper. So that's why the mix time is important. The cohesion test, this is the equipment we use. You're putting a sample underneath this padded foot, and you're applying a torque, um, and you twist on the surface of that sample and make sure it's going to hold up so that you don't put traffic on it too soon. Here you can see pickup um, from tires because uh, traffic was put on it too soon. Here's the, uh, the consistency test. Here's one that's too, too many liquids in there. And this is looking good right here. This is in specification, nice mix there. Wet stripping, if you can see, some of these aggregates no longer have asphalt on the surface. Uh, and that's due to stripping of, of the binder. And hopefully we can catch that in the laboratory. So then we take, once we've got the mix down, and we will typically look at uh, three different emulsion contents. We want to find what's our minimum binder content and what's our maximum um, before we either shed or we bleed. Uh, and these performance tests that we do in the lab are going to give us an indication of that. How how much do we need it? Uh, in how much binder do we need in the system to give us the right um, right mix and the right cured surface so that it holds together for many years? One of these tests is the wet track abrasion test, and I'll have pictures of these after this slide, where we um, soak the samples in water either for an hour, and in the case of uh, micro, we'll, we'll soak it for six days, and then we'll abrade the surface and see whether it ravels um, or falls apart, uh, which will give us an indication that we probably don't have enough binder in there. Then we can put together other samples for what we call the loaded wheel test, and we can look for displacement. Are we going to rut? Are we, is the material going to deform? Um, are we going to see uh, through the excess asphalt um, test, which is also run on the same equipment, are we going to see bleeding? So this test on the loaded wheel is going to give us an indication of the maximum binder content um, for the system. Then for microservicing, we have a, um, another test called the SBNR, the Schultz, Brewer, and Ruck, which uh, we, you take mainly the fines component of the aggregate and mix it with the binder, the emulsion, and uh, you form little pucks or pills and you run them through 
a whole host of tests to see if that binder is going to hold those binds together. So the microsurfacing uh, mix design process is going to take about two weeks, and the slurry seal mix design is going to take about a week, uh, and it's going to give you a lot of information. So um, here, okay, here we go. This is the wet track abrasion tester. So it's just uh, a lot of this equipment, I like to say, was created in some guy's garage. He saw a niche and went out and filled it. So this is a Hobart mixer, which is used for pizza dough or making cakes, and it's been modified um, to have, and it's going to have a piece of uh, tubing or hose that's going to abrade the surface of the sample. So here we've made a, uh, we make up different samples of the different emulsion loadings and contents for mineral filler, et cetera, that we deemed best uh, through our hand mixing process. And we create this sample that's going to be about the depth of what is laid out uh, in the field. And then we abrade it and we see, do we get any raveling? The loaded wheel tester, uh, we're going to create a sample that looks like this. And it's going to be underneath a wheel with 125 pounds on it. And it's going to track back and forth and through a, a thousand cycles. And we're going to measure it and see uh, how much it deformed under that weight. And then we can put some hot sand on it. And we can see how much sand sticks to the surface through another few hundred cycles, and if a lot of sand sticks to it, then we it's an indication we've got too much binder in there, and we're going to end up with bleeding. So there's the purpose behind that test. Here's the SBNR test, uh, just to see how compatible the fines are with, um, with the binder in the system. And there's these tubes that we fill up with water and these little cups or pills, depending on what part of the country you're from. I know the Canadians like to call them pups because they're big hockey players. Um, and you, you abrade it. It tumbles like a washing machine for three hours. And you see how well it holds up. You look at it. You boil it in some water. You look at it again, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> Pretty rigorous test for micro. All right, so here's another question. If your aggregate supply changes during a job, do you need a new mix design? All right. Yes, you are correct. So if any of you have seen me do um, my uh, mix table de demonstration, I like to show, uh, I like to take one type 2 aggregate and do a hand mix with it and say, OK, all things being equal except for the aggregate, I'll substitute in a second aggregate with all the same proportions of emulsion and water, et cetera, and do the hand mix and demonstrate that with one, I'm getting a nice 300 seconds uh, mix time, and with the next, with another aggregate, I'm getting 15 seconds. So not all aggregates are created equal. Um, if, even if they have the same gradation, they're not going to behave the same ne necessarily in the field. So if you need to change aggregate supplies, you need a new mix design. So what is the test method used for wet track abrasion testing? So that is all uh, found in the ISSA guidelines, A143 and A105. And it's called the wet track abrasion test. I think the technical bulletin number is 100. So there's technical bulletins from ISSA that you can purchase um, that give you all of these test methods. And you can also find. Um, to some extent, they're an ASTM as well and AASHTO as well. But at ISSA will give you a, a nice little booklet with the performance guidelines and all the test, uh, technical bulletins included. OK, so what does the design boil down to? It's going to tell you, are these materials compatible? and um, 
are they going to perform in the field? Are you going to get some long-term performance out of them? So if you have a quality emulsion, if you have good aggregate, and you find the right uh, chemistry uh, to, for handling and getting the mix to set off and cure at the right time, uh, the emulsion suppliers have a lot of experience in this, then you're going to take all those components and you're going to get a nice finished product. One thing to remember is that these systems are designed in the laboratory at uh, ambient temperatures and at normal humidity. Um, if, you're, if the person supplying your mix design, which most of us who do mix designs have is lots of experience, they're going to understand the environment where you're applying your uh, mix and they're going to take into consideration that you might be working in the Mojave Desert or you might be working uh, in the Sierra Nevadas or wherever it is or you're on the coast somewhere with lots of humidity. Um, these will be taken into consideration when the design is being done. Uh, the design itself is just going to show you that the um, systems can work. Uh, uh, you do have to have quality material being supplied and continuously supplied throughout the project. And then you need a good contractor who can actually take this system and make it work. So constructability is as important as the mix design that's issued for these projects. There's a ton of information out there um, for, and it's all non-proprietary. Again, ISSA being one of the, probably a good place to start. Um, and yeah, there's lots of existing specifications. There's no need to reinvent the wheel if you're going to if you're trying to create a spec for your agency, I would recommend using the performance guidelines that I've already mentioned. Here are some helpful links that, and again, you will get these uh, when you get the presentation. So FHWA has recently come out with new checklists um, for micro and slurry, and also I think now it includes checklists for the materials. Uh, not just what the mat looks like and, and that sort of thing. ISSA, again, dot .org, uh, Pavement Preservation and Recycling Alliance, the PPRA. Uh, they have great resources um, for the roadresource.org. If you haven't checked that out, I highly recommend it. And then uh, if you're looking for an accredited lab, ASHTO resource, that colon in between the reinforce is not an error. It is how they, it's, it's their thing. Um, but they have an accreditation program, and you can go online and you can view um, anyone who's accredited. You can view what they're accredited for. So if you're looking for some, and you can look it up by uh, location, area, et cetera, if you're looking for a lab. That would be one way to do it. So Jason, I think, or Allie, one of you want to mention the next? Yep. Thanks again, uh, Sally, for presenting today. We really appreciate it. It was very valuable. Um, for everyone on the call, our next webinar is scheduled for December 17th, and it will be on SDR. Um, there's a link in this PowerPoint, and we'll also be sending out via email um, when we send the recording of the presentation uh, within the next week. Jason? Thanks, Allie. Yeah. Okay, Sally, uh, we got some time for some questions. It looks like Juan has a question is, can we explain the process of designing an asphalt emulsion for slurry or a micro? Right. <clears throat> OK, so uh, most emulsion manufacturers have uh, experience, a lot of experience in making these emulsions for these systems. And they have certain chemistries um, to their, at their disposal. There's lots of emulsifiers. Uh, there's a couple of good emulsifier suppliers out there. Um, that we have relationships with. But we uh, we look at when you're making the asphalt emulsion, you have an emulsifier, and that emulsifier uh, dosage, so to speak, how much of that emulsifier you're using in the system can be adjusted up or down uh, depending on uh, how fast or how slow you want that emulsion to react with the aggregate in the system. So if I, for instance, I uh, formulate here 
at the beginning of the season, when it's nice and cool, we'll have a little faster emulsion. And then as the summer heats up, we might slow that uh, system down a little bit to compensate for uh, hotter days. Also, we can formulate using either a different type of emulsifier if we're using, say, uh, a difficult aggregate. Um, we can adjust the emulsifier dosage specific to the aggregate that's on the job. Um, there's lots of different ways to do that. Uh, so it's kind of a trick of the trade for the emulsifier supplier to figure out that chemistry and dosage level depending on the project, the aggregate, and the time of year. Got another question, Sally. Is there a minimum crack size for a slurry fill? Um, I maybe <laughs> depends. Uh, I I don't know if I would say there's a minimum crack size, but it depends on whether you're going. If you're just doing one layer of slurry, I would I recommend uh, you crack fill. Um, and that would be a question more for the, the, the crack filling guys. Uh, but minor, you know, minor um, cracks, I would say you don't need to fill. Um, if you're getting up, you know, past a quarter inch or um, beyond there, you, you probably want to. Another option is uh, you can use, like I think I mentioned earlier, you can do a scratch course. So you can put down um, a thinner layer of slurry or micro uh, and kind of level it off um, as you go, and it can act as a mass crack filler. Uh, when we do multi-layer systems, that's often the approach that will be taken. So that scratch course can fill those cracks, and then you come through with another one or two layers of either chip fill or micro or slurry to give you the wearing course. Oh, good response, Sally. Now I have a, a basic 101 question for you, emulsions. What is the difference between a set and a cure terminology? Uh, so I, uh, we all might say a little differently what we think it is. So we go break, set, cure. The system breaks when it starts to stiffen up. Um, and it's not reversible. You can't add water or more emulsion to the system and get that nice mix again. When it's down on, on the road and it starts to set, that is likely what that cohesion test is going to tell you. You're going to be able to start putting um, slow-moving traffic. So when it's set, you can touch the mat and pull your fingers away, and you'll have water on your fingers and not brown emulsion. So if you've got brown emulsion on your fingers, then don't put any traffic on it. But if it's starting, it's just uh, water, then you're probably set, and you can start putting cross traffic, um, slow moving. You don't want a lot of turning, starting, stopping on that type. Once it's cured, that's when the water has come out of the system and you've got your complete mat. And that process could take a week, two weeks. Thanks, Sally. Mm -hmm. uh, got another question here, and it's on ADA requirements, so uh, I'll let you, and I can help with it a little bit, but can we explain the reasoning behind why a micro triggers an ADA but slurry does not? No, I cannot explain that. <laughs> and, and Sally, I'll, I'll help you with this one. Um, okay. These, these requirements came from, from another agency uh, by itself, and there was no uh, working relationship with the Federal Highway with the Department of Labor on this, so it, it became a real issue, and it continues to be a problem. But again, we really need to focus on ADA requirements for free people that are disabled, and um, we need to make sure that we have our proper, um, proper uh, looking for the right word, I'm looking for, we make sure we have our, our things in the future where it triggers um, that there are going to be projects in the future that are going to be taken care of to help with these ramps. So it doesn't hinder the ADA people because we have to put ourselves in, the, in their footsteps. 
by putting that thicker material in there will handicap them as they go through some of these intersections. And, and these ADA requirements have been out there for 20 some years. It's just unfortunately over the last four or five years, we've been, or maybe six or seven, we've been struggling about how we're going to take care of it. But I think we're doing a good job and uh, I think we just need to continue on and, and try to do the best we can. Right. And feel free to chime in if I missed anything. So. Yeah, there, it, of course, there's been a lot of discussion around this over the um, the past years since this uh, came about. But I, I would say, too, um, if you have a project that where where you you really don't uh, need need to uh, redo everything for the ADA. Um, if you don't want to do all your curbs and gutters and corners and sidewalks and all that, uh, you could polymer modified slurry fields. We just showed that uh, that stuff, that there's a new um, tech, um, recommended guidelines for that out from ISSA. It any more these days, a lot of the polymer modified slurry fields can give you performance um, that's getting closer and closer to that of a microsurfacing. Uh, so I would just put that out there. No, very well said, Sally. And again, the folks just make sure that they got projects that are going in in the near future to take care of those ramps. That's the most important. And um, I'd recommend that. Sally, I'm not sure if we captured this question or not about fibers and micro. Uh, I, I touched on it a little bit in the presentation that um, there's there's a lot going on now with fiber and microsurfacing. Uh, I would say I know that we do a lot of work out here that involves the fiber. I think it's a great product. Um, you're taking a fiber and you're you're cutting it on the paver, um, on the back of the paver, and, it, and you have spools of fiber, and you're putting about quarter inch size fiber into the mix at about a 0.2% on weight of aggregate. And it's going to, it's a, it's a lot more fiber than it sounds like. You can see it. When you drive down a fiber micro road, you can see the glass fibers shining in the light. Um, we just did, my neighborhood actually, we did a double fiber micro that uh, looks fantastic. But it, it gives you a little more durability, uh, flexibility in the mat. Uh, it, it's, ha it's showing some proven benefits. So uh, it might be a little more costly than a, don't ask me about dollars, but it, it'll probably be a little more costly than a regular micro, but something, uh, something worth looking into. Oh, that's great, Sally. Um, so that ADA requirements, I'll, I'll try to, while well, we got a little time here, I'll try to put a website in there for folks to go to for further information regarding ADA requirements. But the word I was looking for is a transition plan. And that's what they really, agencies really need to make sure that's on their radar screen. All right. Uh, I, see some, I see some questions here about testing. Um, Technique for wet track abrasion test. Um, getting different results. I, yes, I have seen in the laboratory uh, that if, if, if the technique isn't good, you can get much worse results on the wet track abrasion test because you're not creating a, a smooth surface. So technique matters. Uh, I recommend also that if you're doing a mixed design that one technician do the entire design and not have more than one do other portions. And what uh, another thing that ties into that wet track abrasion test is you see in some areas uh, field wet track abrasions. I would just kind of warn that the wet track abrasion is a laboratory test and it was designed to be done in the laboratory. So efforts to try and do this in the field um, have met with some resistance from the contractors. It, it can be an issue. If that a lot of times we'll see these engineering firms will go out there and it'll be the first wet track they've ever made in their life, and they're doing it on your job in the field, and then trying to get it to a lab and run the test. 
Uh, if you want to run wet track abrasions in the course of your job, then I recommend you pull all the raw materials from the project and send them to a lab and have the laboratory put the samples together to make sure that they're still compatible and holding together. Sally, I had another question. How much total water percent is too much? Uh, that's a good question. I warn often against overusing water. So you can see the overuse. There's, there's a couple of problems that you're going to run against if you're using too much water. One is that you will float your finds and you'll get a mat on, you'll, you'll get your finds and the binder uh, might cure on the surface of the mat and then everything underneath that is not cured. So when you go to put traffic on there, it's going to peel up that, um, that film that formed on the surface because you had too much water in there and floated all those fines. Another issue, uh, if you're working with an aggregate that is really reactive, you may get what we refer to as a false flurry. So it might look like that you have a mix, but actually the emulsion has already started to break because of the aggregate. Um, and then the, the guy on the back of the paver is going to put a lot of water in that mix to get the workability that he needs to get it on the road, but you're never going to have good adhesion. Um, so if you notice that the superintendent is cranking the water to the system, there's probably something larger at work there. So I recommend in the field, if, you're, if you feel that you need to open up that water valve to get the mix that you're looking for, um, there's other things to try. You can increase your emulsion content by a half percent to get more mix time out of it. You can use your additive on the tank. Um, you may want to send your aggregate in to make sure that it hasn't changed, um, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, and uh, one thing I didn't mention in the um, presentation that you can look out for, too, is in micro and slurry, if the aggregate has been freshly crushed, like within the past couple of weeks, that's going to could cause you a lot of problems because it's going to be more reactive. Um, that the energy that goes in the crushing process is going to be on the surface of that rock. It won't matter if you're doing hot mix, um, but if you're doing slurry or micro, it's going to cause um, a more reactive mix uh, and set that emulsion off a lot quicker than it would if it had been crushed 60 days ago. Did I answer right. that question? Great, res great response, Ellen. Uh, the design for night works is it best to modify the type of emulsifier or add other chemicals or a combination of both? Um, typically, it's the emulsifier. It's all kind of controlled by the emulsifier in the emulsion. Um, and the mixed design lab will know, needs to know that it's going to be night work for one, and the emulsion supplier needs to know that it's going to be night work so that they, they can formulate it appropriately. But I know that when we're doing night work, um, I adjust the emulsifier content. Uh, you can change the emulsifier if you have a, if, the, if, if you know that one works better for you at night than the other. Other ways you're going to control your mix at night is with the mineral filler. So you need to know how that affects the mix as well, whether going up in your mineral content, mineral filler content um, speeds up the process or slows it down. What I find is that the cement will either give you more mix time or give you less mix time, depending on the aggregate, but it always helps with the curing process once it's on the ground. You, it, you could have a world of difference in the amount of time it takes for that mat to cure if you don't have any cement in it. So night work should always have some level of, of mineral filler in it. Great, Sally. If we have a few more here. Always a question, would you recommend a tack coat? 
if you're doing a micro or a uh, slurry? Uh, that's a debatable. That's debatable. I would say, um, depending on, it would maybe depend a little bit on what your surface, your paving over looks like, but I think the um, you have enough emulsion in the mix of a slurry or micro that it, adds, it acts a bit like a tack coat itself. Um, so there's not really necessarily a need. The higher need is to make sure that your surface is clean. You don't want a dusty um, surface. You don't want standing water, that kind of stuff. So a nice if a sweeping operation prior to laying the micro slurry is going to be more important than spraying, spraying a tack coat, I think. No, great, great response. But again, um, I think some of the Midwest states have found that, uh, again, on the pavement surfaces, depending upon the texture of it, um, for the cost, it doesn't take all that much to uh, to put that tack code in to help make sure you get that proper bond. That's my two cents. And I think there's, there'll be mixed right. feelings about that. But again, um, for the cost, it's, it's not all that much more to do that. I don't think. I don't think it's going to hurt you um, as long as uh, you is applied properly and that you allow it to cure out before you put the micro or, or slurry on top of it. Well said. Well said. John, Juwan Juw has a question. What additives can be used uh, in a site for the micro is, if, if the micro is breaking too fast? Are there any recommendations you might have? Uh, again, with the micro, if it's breaking too fast, you need to be having a conversation with the emulsion supplier first and foremost. You can use um, the additive, the, the contractor can use whatever additive the mix design uh, calls for, which for out here we mainly use aluminum sulfate as the additive, and the rest of the country probably is more apt to use um, a solution of the emulsifier. Um, either way, that's on board the paver to to slow the mix down or give a little more workability. Uh, if you do use aluminum sulfate, you have to be careful not to overdo it because you can too much is not a good thing with with the sulfate. But the emulsifier, you can add minimal amounts and get a lot of um, a lot more mix time out of the system. But again, you have to be careful that you don't overdo it then you're, it's going to take too long for your mat to cure. So the, emuls, the, the additive, uh, and that typically is going to be recommended by the emulsion supplier what you should be using. And then your mineral filler also can be used to slow or speed up the micro mix depending on how it reacts with the aggregate. I've, I work with several aggregates that it actually slows the system down um, when you add the mineral filler that ultimately causes the mat to cure out faster. So these are all things to discuss with your mix design supplier and your emulsion supplier. I would agree with that, Sally. Uh, depending on your project, really work with them on that supplier for the how quick, the fast set time, whatever all those things. If you've got a, a roadway that has a lot of traffic in, work with that supplier to provide that material that will meet your requirements. And just don't wait till the last minute because it may be too late uh, to get those things changes made. Right. I'm going to take a stab at this, Matt, and we're going to do the best we can to answer this question, only because this is more of a mixed design and a not a construction related uh, training course. But you mentioned it. Is there any kind of forensic document you could recommend for the occasion that a finished job isn't satisfactory? And uh, uh, Sally, I'm not sure if you want to cover that one, but well, I mean, you can you can look to other agencies for how they spell that out in their specifications. Uh, for instance, um, it's Caltrans has some verbiage in their Section 37 that says if there's uh, I don't know if there's streaking like. Sometimes you might get an oversized stone or something, and it, it, it has language on if there's 
so much of this in a in a certain in a certain stance of the road, or if there's there's certain things that are looked for, then um, there's either going to be a penalty or remove and replace kind of stuff. Um, it's one thing to remember with micro and slurry, it's not going to look like hot mix. It is not hot mix. It won't be a perfect, if the hot mix is done well, it's a beautiful, perfect black surface. This is, uh, this is not going to be as perfect as a hot mix visually. It's, you can get some really good looking micro out there with, that's going to look great up against the striping. Um, and it's there to serve a separate purpose, but you're not going to get that hot mix look. So don't be looking for that. There are going to be some minor irregularities depending on what your what your road looked like before the application. And then you'll know uh, if you get that inspector's manual from ISSA, it'll talk about um, some irregularities that might occur because of constructability. So trying to understand what it is. Um, that you're looking at is important too, <clears throat> and not expecting perfect, or, or what you're used to if you're a hot mix, if you're used to looking at hot mix. Excuse me. <clears throat> well, great response, Sally. And hopefully, uh, Matt, uh, we helped you with that question. And I think your partners um, out there are more willing to help on that because basically jurisdictions and areas of the country that you're in. Uh, there are people out there that can help you guys work with teams, with the industry as well, the agency is making modifications to their spec to meet those needs. If things have not been working well and they need to be uh, modified, now this is the type of the seasons where those discussions come in, come in really handy because you're able to talk about those things of what needs to be done in those specifications to make it better out there in the field. I have a question, another one here, Sally, is, is it better to have moisture within the aggregate versus adding water into the mix in the plug mill? Say that again. Is it better to have moisture within the aggregate versus adding water into the mix at the plug mill? Um, or in the plug mill? Right. Um, you'll never know. Not really. You don't want your aggregate to be high in moisture, co and moisture. You don't want it to be too moist. Usually that means um, it's been washed and you're, you have um, the potential of losing the fines in the, in the aggregate, which are a very important part of the system. So, I mean, I don't want to give an upper limit, but usually you don't want to be much over 2.5% on the moisture in the, in the aggregate pile. You're going to need so much water in your system that if you added it to your aggregate, it would wash away. Um, so you, when we do the mix design, we take into account the natural water content on, you know, from the crushing process. So that's usually going to be anywhere, depending on how long the pile's been there, uh, a tenth of a percent moisture up to usually, uh, I don't usually see much more than two, two and a half percent. That water content is part of the mix design. So when you see the mix design says 12% water, 2.5% of that is coming from the uh, aggregate already. So that's total total moisture. And then you have water in your emulsion and all that. So there's a, there's so much water going in at the at in the whole system and then into the pub mill that you could you don't want to pre-wet your aggregate if that's what the question is. Just live with what the moisture content is from the crushing process. Good response, Sally. I have another one here. Have you seen surface discoloration due to cement content or type before? And if so, what what would you recommend? So you'll see some surface discoloration sometimes if you have a higher cement content. Uh, over time, that could go away. Um, a lot, some of these mats will look browner or maybe even gray sometimes, depending on what you're working with at the end of a project. But um, 
a, a month or two months later, it, it might look completely different because these, these will sometimes take longer to cure. And also the action of the um, traffic, you know, works on that mat until it's completely cured out. So um, you're getting natural compaction from from the cars and the, tra the traffic going across. Uh, but if you're getting really bad discoloration, um, there it could be that there was a problem in the system, in the mix. When I talked about the false flurry, you might have a system that never, never cures out um, properly because of uh, a, a reactive aggregate. But that's that's few and far between. So usually time will take care of that. Um, but if the mat is cured and it's staying down, um, it's not necessarily something you need to worry about. Uh, Oh, great yeah. response, Sally. Um, I, I switched over now to for an evaluation. Before we, our time is about over, about four more minutes, we'll get to one more question after I talk a little bit about this. But I really request if everybody can take a moment to go through this evaluation. It really helps us for future courses, future trains. And when you go through that, uh, just use the little small arrow with the little line on the far right. Uh, use that to go through to answer your questions and take the time to do that. I appreciate it. In addition, uh, the presentation that uh, Sally provided today is here for download. Please take the moment to do that. As well as we have a webinar series uh, flyer that uh, we have developed, and it basically covers all the webinars that we have discussed since February that a person can download them and watch them at their convenience and we also have one more as Ali mentioned coming up here um, next month on full depth recycling there's further information to register for that and etc so please take the time to do that and uh, Sally we got one more question before we wrap up Molly Anderson asks is can aluminum oxide be used instead of Portland cement in a mix uh, I have not used it um, but it would be something um, that would have to be tested out in the laboratory and approved by the agency. So I'm not going to say no, um, but I, I would be skeptical. Uh, I would just have to, you have to see how it behaves in the mix, through the whole mix design process. Um, yeah. Great that response, uh, well, while, while we wrap it up again, I want to say thank you, Sally, for your time today, as well as if you're looking for further documentation, further information, we mentioned the, the uh, CPRA website folks can go to, resource.org. Through that, you can find information for EMA, ERA, and ISA. There's products and treatments out there for further information. Uh, please take the opportunity to go through those and uh, um, I think you'll find it of a value. With that, Sally, would you have any things to wrap things up? Do you have any last words? I, I would just say that um, if I didn't answer your question, my contact information is at the end of the presentation. You can send me an email or give me a call, and I'm always happy to help out with any questions you might have on micro slurry and um, uh, specifications, that sort of thing. So, and thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, Sally. Yeah. Well, I, again, wish everybody a good afternoon, and thanks for participating in today's webinar. Have a great day. Thank you, and again, that does conclude today's call. You may now disconnect.